one thing that you certainly try to do is mimic the same renovation over and over again. What does that allow you to do? To one of your points, with certain materials, you can buy them in bulk, especially if you have the luxury of storing on site, get a discount on that front. The best way, short term, gaining those cost advantages, long term, when you do have to make turns or you do have to make uh, renovations down the road, you don't need to find the tiles for this unit, the cabinets for that unit. It's creating a standard across all the units is just the most cost effective way to do it, the most practical way to do it from a management running the property. I think someone's first real estate deal gives you a lot of insight into what shaped them as a real estate entrepreneur, a real estate professional. So I'd love to start with like your first real estate deal and maybe what you learned from it and how it shaped you. Oh God. Um, my first deal was, uh, or first I should say group of deals, uh, were interesting to say the least. Uh, my dad and I, came out of, or we came out of the GFC, the great financial crisis and, uh, ended up pursuing an opportunity in a little town called Waterbury, Connecticut, which for anyone that doesn't know about Connecticut or Waterbury specifically, um, 30, 40 years ago, Waterbury was a very vibrant city. It was named the brass capital of the world or some facsimile. Uh, unfortunately today, and more specifically 10, 15 years ago, uh, it hit really hard times. The, the governor of the city loved to say the city has great bones, but it lacked, uh, most of the things that make a city a, a, uh, what makes it work. Um, we. I got introduced a friend to a friend to look at some properties in this city. Uh, they were personally looking at two and four family homes and the pricing for these things were so low. When I first looked at this and I was just out of college, um, I was briefly, I did a stint with Marcus and Millichap, uh, in investment sales. But, uh, very shortly after that, I, I received this introduction. I went out and saw this. I saw the pricing for these for these properties, these units. And I said to myself, and I said to my dad, there is no way that this could fail. This is, uh, it doesn't matter what the, 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 the end result is. We're going to make money doing this. We were buying these homes, uh, literally two to four family homes for as low as $10,000 for the entire home, uh, up to if they were nicer uh, properties, meaning they had like all of their walls and like a full roof and everything. Uh, we, those would go up into like the 40, $50,000 range. Um, just a very quick, my dad had been in real estate for most of his life. He was a broker, got into ownership. Uh, and, uh, he, he ran into some issues in the GFC himself. And so this was something, it was an opportunity for us not only to work together on something, but uh, uh, he was much further along in his career, came with a lot of experience. Um, but uh, at any rate, that's, that's, how, that's why we even teamed up to do something like this. Well, we go in there and, uh, and we visit this thing, we see these things, we say to ourselves, you know, Pricing is, is, is great. His background was raising money. That was his big thing, raising money for deals. And, uh, and we went out and we raised a couple million bucks. And, uh, from 2009 to maybe, uh, late 2010, we ended up buying 30 of these things, 30 individual properties, uh, a, a low of two units. A high, actually, our, our trophy property was a 14 unit, uh, which had two stores in it. And, uh, and so we buy these things, we rehab these things, and, uh, and from, and that, that 
purchase, that purchase program was the beginning of my real estate career. Um, I did the, started a property management company around that. And it was where I learned basically everything. I, almost everything I know about real estate today. And, I, and, and most importantly, I learned almost all the bad stuff about real estate. Uh, I learned that a, or one thing is, uh, if something is looks too good to be true, there's probably a reason. Um, these things that we were buying for so, for such a low price, they needed so much work. There was so much hidden things in the walls. Uh, the, the, no one tells you that, uh, in these distressed areas, when you buy something and you put a lot of money into it, but it's not rented yet. Uh, there's uh, looters that come and they'll take the, they'll literally come and, and take all the work that you did and, uh, and, uh, set you back big time. Well, once we got these things up and running, uh, and leased them, uh, I ended up running them, uh, for the better part of, uh, from 09 till about 14, 15. Um, we did pivot from that eventually, but, uh, it was, it was a, uh, very challenging experience on every level. Um, the management itself was incredibly tough. And what I learned there <clears throat> is maybe the biggest driver to any successful rental real estate, residential real estate, uh, in my opinion, is jobs. And if you don't have jobs uh, in and around the uh, city community, uh, for the most part, the property lacks a reason to exist, it, unless it's a vacation home or some kind of something like that. Um, and if you don't have, so if you don't have jobs, you don't have access to uh, enough qualified renters. And you end up with, uh, unfortunately, very marginal tenancy, very uh, challenged tenancy. You get all the social problems in the world. Um, and uh, it's just a, uh, it's a never ending uh, cycle of, uh, of leasing, trying to collect the rents, unfortunately, evictions, and start uh, rehabbing again because oftentimes, uh, uh, you know, you end up with some not so great people that do not so great things to the, uh, to the units and you just rinse and repeat that cycle all over again. The, maybe the most proud thing I have about that whole experience, a what's fantastic is it started our business in Connecticut. Um, I don't, uh, it, it was some of our money. Uh, and, uh, a lot of investor capital, and I don't take that lightly and I don't want to say I'm happy to start a business, but it was at the expense of our investor capital. What I, what I am most proud of is with all the challenges and we had more than I'm mentioning, uh, and with, uh, uh, well, just with all of that and with the, with the debt that we had on it, we ended up refining at one point and had not, we didn't over lever, but we had a, a good amount of debt on it. Um, we never had a capital call. Uh, we, um, ended up selling it in piecemeal made back, uh, a hundred percent, or actually I think we were just shy of a hundred percent of the original, uh, capital. And uh, anyone that came into those deals with us, uh, we ended up offering to reinvest and everyone took us up on it into new deals at much better terms. And uh, those investors, I'm, I'm uh, confident in saying, have made it back and then some uh, since then. So what did you learn or realize about taking other people's money on that first deal? Well, first of all, um, although I always, I, I have an appreciation, had appreciation for other people's money and just money in general, I don't take money lightly. Um, I certainly learned what it took to 
I'm going to say the word convince, but to convince someone to invest with you, uh, you know, when someone decides to invest with you, they're investing in the project somewhat, but in my opinion, they're investing in you more. Um, I think a, I think a good operator, uh, can turn a good deal bad and a bad operator can turn a bad deal less bad. <laughs> uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's probably impossible to take a really bad deal and, and make it good no matter what you do. But, uh, and uh, being as young as I was, certainly I was uh, teamed up with my dad. He had a lot of experience. My dad's experience, as I mentioned, was mostly raising money. It wasn't nearly as much on the actual running of the properties. But um, but he was he was uh, was is an asset, uh, and and provided a lot of advice there. But uh, convincing people to give you their money to invest and trusting you to do that. Um, is a uh, a difficult thing. It's a uh, it's even more difficult if you're uh, raw and you're you know asking someone to really go out on a limb for you. Um, and that uh, as you as I got into the process, um, I I don't know if it's I learned this or it's just it, what kept on going through my mind through the whole process is. I owe these investors 120% of my effort and attention. And I, I recognized what I presented to them was not happening. You know, we weren't getting the distributions that I had anticipated when I, when I was raw and saw $10,000 units and said, $800 rents, we're going to put 30, how are we not going to make money? Uh, that, that didn't end up happening, but, uh, but just giving it, as I mentioned, all my attention uh, and all my effort to ensure that I did everything I could to, uh, get them their money back. Um, and if it didn't happen, it wasn't going to be a lack of effort from my part. Um, and I think that, I think starting off with a, with a bad deal, really, really, uh, what's the word it, um, it ingrains that in you. Uh, just how important that is. And I think a lot of the investors recognized that um, and had a lot to do with why they were willing to keep on going with us on the next uh, on the next opportunities. So you're starting this new company, you're making investments. Why did you also want to create a management platform? Because a lot of people could have just hired a manager. Why was that important to you to be a manager as well as an investment manager? I, uh, I'm not sure I knew all the reasons back then. I can tell you the, the biggest reason, and I still very much believe it, is no one's going to care about your property as much as you do. Um, no one's going to uh, want to save a dollar more than you will. Uh, I, I think my dad or someone said this, you can get someone to, to turn a screw for a dollar or 10 cents. And it's the same screw and it's the same everything. It's just a matter of how many phone calls you're willing to make. And uh, and so relying on a third party to manage the property, uh, properties, um, in my opinion, you're not giving yourself the best chance to succeed. Not to mention, everyone needs to make money. If someone's going to be working on something, everyone needs to make money. And I wholeheartedly believe that. But if it's something that you feel that you can do uh, and it's not preventing you from doing other responsibilities, uh, then I think uh, I think you should, frankly. Um, and rewinding back to when it happened, I think it was it was part necessity. We were uh, we were very small. Once again, I was very raw. Um, and I also think a part of me felt. I didn't know enough and what's what better way to learn about real estate and learn about management, but management really means kind of the, the bones of what makes these things work. Um, what's better than that than just doing it. Um, and so that's what I did. And uh, I, I, there was even times that um, whether we were short on construction people or, or frankly wanted to make a few extra bucks, uh, 
uh, we would actually do some of the minor rehabs ourselves. And that's, uh, I feel badly for anyone that ended up having to live in one of those units that I worked on. Uh, I, that's not my forte, but uh, but it was part of the whole process of not only wanting to learn everything, but also feeling having this feeling like if I could do it, I should be doing it. Um, and maybe uh, some for you, you really you learn over time that uh, that might be uh, you might be better off having someone that is really trained or or knows what they're doing in certain areas. Uh, do the things that they are best at and allow you to do the things that you're ultimately best at. I am. Um, I'm just not sure I knew what the things were that I was best at back then. I have a hunch that in early parts of new real estate cycles, like you were in, in 2009, like we're probably in right now that the people that do better are the ones that are kind of the boots on the ground people the operator types and not the large Excel modeling strategists in a private equity firm. I was actually meeting with a friend of mine that runs a huge private equity firm. And I think one of the things that he is struggling with now in this period is like finding that edge in his guys or, or pushing them to get that edge. But I'd love for you to talk about maybe your experience and in, in how you've cultivated that edge over time and what advantage that gives you versus other people that just aren't on the ground that are maybe just sitting in front of a computer mm -hmm. screen. Sure. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I am partners with, uh, with a number of, uh, funds and, uh, private equity guys like you're talking about, and I appreciate them. And most of the projects we do, uh, can't happen without them. You know, the, the, it, it's such a necessary part of our, of our ecosystem. Uh, especially as deals get bigger, you need people with the ability to write bigger checks. Why would someone like them, uh, why would someone like them invest with someone like me? I think real estate is very much a local man's game. Um, and someone in their shoes, uh, you know, their, their goal is to put out capital. And in order to do that, you don't probably have the luxury of being focused on one micro, uh, uh, you know, area or, you know, region, uh, you've got to put out capital. And that means you have to expand your, uh, the area that you're looking in. And so they need to rely on, uh, finding people like me that are really quote unquote experts in the area that they're investing in, uh, to be successful. Well, like I said, I think real estate is a local man's game and, uh, there's, there's so many things that come into play, uh, when you're analyzing a deal or, uh, looking at a new area that if you aren't, if you aren't there, uh, if you aren't, um, you know, living it, I just feel like there's so much opportunity to miss things. And, uh, you know, going back to uh, my first uh, foray that we were talking about, I just looked at the dollars on a paper, I, you know, and I, I just looked at the numbers on a paper and I, and I didn't take into account the fact that, as I mentioned, there's no jobs in this area that I, uh, you you walk around there and there's a reason that things were so underpriced well if you're so, if you're so removed from the properties you're never going to uh you're never going to have that color uh that can be the difference between something that is successful something that isn't successful just looking at something on paper um you know doesn't tell the whole story and so being on the ground, um, living and breathing the areas that I'm now invested in, I know the areas of town of specific towns that are good, that aren't good for a number of reasons, uh, whether it's economic, uh, whether it's school systems, whether it's, uh, um, I don't know, th things that I'm not even thinking of right now, but it, you just have a, a much deeper understanding of what it is that you're going to be investing in. 
um, by being closer to the assets. And, uh, and I think that that is necessary. And uh, I don't know if it gives me an edge against, uh, against people in other markets. I think that there's a lot of me's in other markets, but I think uh, it certainly gives me an edge in my market, knowing how deeply I've penetrated uh, all these areas that I'm invested in uh, and knowing what I want to look for and don't want to look for. I think in certain markets and certain times, a lot of people today are finding these opportunities and you're reading about them in the paper where, you know, the debt was 50 million and someone's now buying it for 25 million. And that discount is just so attractive. In your experience, what has always been more indicative of success when you're buying something that cheap? Is it like the bones of the building or is it the market that you're in? Which one has a higher weight, weighted probability on the outcome of the deal? I would say almost certainly the market that you're in. The, the bones of the building, you can, that can translate from market to market. Um, you know, if you're going to rehab something, you're not going to, you don't necessarily need to rehab it differently in Connecticut versus Florida. I mean, I guess they're, maybe that's not the best example because there's some weather things that come into play, but, but generally, uh, the process is pretty similar, uh, in that kitchens and, and bathrooms, kitchens and bathrooms, it, you, you nailed it, a uh, little landscaping, but the market, in my opinion, is what drives everything. The market jobs does this area have a reason to exist does it have a reason to uh expand uh, is there a reason for population growth to happen in that area population growth almost certainly goes hand in hand with rising rents um that is uh that is the everything in my opinion um there are nuances on the property itself the physical property that can be uh, arguably on some level of importance. And it, it, environmental things, you know, things that are truly just unknowns. Uh, if, you're, if you're getting something incredibly inexpensively, but it has a, an asbestos issue, a uh, underground uh, oil issue, you know, whatever it is, something that you can't just easily quantify, well, that, uh, that's something that requires much more attention. Beyond that, uh, if you're getting a deal on something that has generally four walls and a roof uh, and you know how to rehab something or, or ground up, uh, then all that matters at that point, it doesn't matter where it is for you to be able to do that. All that matters at that point is, is it worth it to put all that effort in, in the market that you're looking at? And uh, that is, uh, that's, that's the driver. I love how you say, does this place have a reason to exist? Because I think historically, a lot of real estate investing has been based on like historical trends of the specific market. But now with technology and migration patterns, a lot of places might have existed in the past, but really don't have a primary driver of why they're going to exist successfully in the future and how have you as you've grown the business thought through that and identified markets that you thought had staying power where you weren't worried that you know the one factory or the big employer would go out of business and then your yeah. momentum would be shot well you you just kind of nailed it on one aspect and that is uh that one employer i have always shied away from that um and there's something relatively recently that it was turned out to be a mistake, but you, you can't win them all. I was, I was looking at something in, uh, in Groton, Connecticut, which is up the, for anyone that doesn't know, it's up the coastline as you're going towards Rhode Island on the 90, I-95 corridor. And uh, I had an opportunity to buy a sizable property up there, uh, slightly distressed, it's maybe five, six years ago, uh, and it was coming off of, if I remember correctly, it was coming off of 
a LIHTC program. There's, um, I'm never going to come up with what low the income housing tax credit or credit. something. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Low income housing tax credit. Those things last for, uh, I think they go 15 years, 30 years. What it is, is someone uh, put a, a lot of money into it way back when, 15, 30 years ago, and they got these tax credits for doing so. So it's a whole separate business that I know just enough about to be dangerous, but I don't, I don't fully understand it. Well, it was coming off of that. I think it had a few years left. And while it's under the LIHTC umbrella, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, all the rents are capped at certain rents. Once it once it gets out of that, whether it's 15 or 30 years, everything reverts to having no caps and you can bring rents to market. Um, this particular property is about 300 units and uh, it was in this town, Throtten, in the main, uh, main slash almost only employer there is um, uh, a submarine. What are they called? Um, Oh my God. Drawing a blank on that. It's a, it's a, a defense contractor. They build submarines and, uh, and they employ everyone in this area. As much as the deal looked like a, a strong deal and as much as, uh, um, the renters in that area seem to have a good, uh, there seem to be good economics behind everyone. Um, I, on the one yard line or close to it, I decided to not bid up to the number that I knew would take it, uh, because I was a electric boat is the name. And I was afraid that electric boat one day would say, you know, it's been great here, but, uh, we're going to, uh, Delaware and now Groton has no reason to exist anymore. Fast forward to today, um, electric boat signed something like a 15 or 20 year extension on their government contract to build umpteen number of these nuclear subs. They brought in a gazillion new employees and the area has exploded uh, with development and whatnot. Um, so chalk that up to one that was missed, but I don't disagree with the, with the concept just because that one, uh, didn't work out for me. I am always hesitant to be reliant on one sole source of an economic driver uh, to give a place a reason. Um, and the the flip side of that, something that was a positive related to what I'm doing right now, um, when when COVID happened, uh, it kind of did the opposite kind of gave a lot of places that did not have a reason to exist. Uh, it, it gave them, uh, it gave them a chance, you know, people overnight realized I don't have to live in the city, in my, in my closet of an apartment to have access to all the jobs. Uh, if I can work remotely or, only have to commute two, three days a week. It just expands the the uh, perimeter of where someone could realistically live and still have access to a lot of jobs. Um, and if you give someone a choice of living in a closet in New York City, let's say, and paying their their four thousand dollars a month of rent, or living somewhere outside of the city where they don't have to commute every day and, and having a place for the same place that's three, four, five times the size, uh, I would say most people are probably going to take the space uh, than not. Well, uh, right when COVID happened, I, um, I ended up acquiring a 130-unit uh, uh, new build uh, a traditional multifamily building in a town called Granby, Connecticut. Uh, Granby is a suburb of Hartford, Connecticut, the capital of uh, Connecticut. Hartford, unfortunately, itself is not a huge economic driver. It has a lot of, it's still, it has a lot of ailments, it's had a lot of ailments, it's got financial issues, it's got uh, 
all sorts of demographic issues. Um, the suburbs around Hartford have always been a desirable place. And a lot of the jobs that, uh, and specifically insurance and defense that left Hartford, they didn't leave Hartford County. They just left Hartford proper. Um, and that in itself, uh, was a bit of a boom for the for the outskirts of Hartford. But that alone, I wouldn't say is the reason that Granby and others uh, now has a reason to exist. A lot of it, in my opinion, has to do with the fact that the footprint got expanded from where people can work from. And all of a sudden, an area around Hartford that was desirable, uh, I think, became much more desirable. It, uh, the, the rents are more affordable. The area is beautiful, and it hadn't received nearly the attention, nearly the development that a lot of other areas had. And so after acquiring that uh, that building in 2020, uh, I've since focused on building uh, something that's very prevalent across the country, not very prevalent at all, uh, really no one doing it in any scale in Connecticut, and that's building communities in the build for rent, single family rental space. Um, that and that whole endeavor that I'm on right now, that whole, uh, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, that pursuit of, of building those uh, communities is partly because Hartford proper has had its issues, which made the outskirts more desirable. But it is really a lot to do with COVID and just that expanding that footprint and uh, and giving people the flexibility to live further away from the jobs and uh, and live uh, and and the desire both the ability and the desire to have more space uh, with where they live. You built up this pretty sizable multifamily portfolio and are now focusing very heavily on build for rent communities what's so appealing about that model versus your years of experience in multifamily and what is the opportunity that you're seeing in that space that maybe does or doesn't exist right now in multi the pivot was i would say born uh more out of this is not the right word but more out of necessity than, uh, you know, based more than trying to reinvent ourselves. And what do I mean by that? Uh, after that stint in Waterbury, which, which set the, the, the platform for uh, much better things to come, we quickly transitioned into buildings um, focused on distressed buildings and, uh, and focused on areas uh, that uh, were closer to jobs, closer to uh, transportation networks, closer to, uh, in Connecticut, uh, a desirable thing is the salt water, Long Island Sound, closer to things that uh, really have, uh, should or will or should give people a reason to want to live in those communities. Um, we, were f we ended up focusing on a town called Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, it is. It was and is the low cost provider uh, in Fairfield County, which is one of the more opulent counties, frankly, probably in the country. Uh, but you had the ability to buy uh, housing at very uh, desirable uh, numbers, um, having a lot to do with the history of Bridgeport. Uh, just never, never being able to get out of its own way. It had had political issues in its history, financial issues, but the bones were so obvious. The, uh, the opportunity was so obvious and, and just seeing that, that what that five minutes away, it's going over an imaginary border. You, we were buying units for 30, 40,000. Those same units were 150 or 200,000, you know, five minutes away the, the, it seemed so obvious, but no one wanted to touch the that specific area. We went in there, um, 
and ended up building up a sizable portfolio uh, over basically from 2011 till maybe 2019 or so. Um, and it was sometime around 16, 17 that I started, we started to realize uh, it was becoming much tougher to do what we had been doing for so long. Uh, much less opportunities, much more competition. And as the competition came in, um, it started to push the pricing up and it started to push it to levels that we just knew from being in these areas for so long and owning so many properties and managing so many properties over time. You just learn there's a certain point where this starts to not make sense. And that, uh, as I mentioned, it was around 2016, 17 that uh, we um, found it actually uh, impossible to find a new deal, uh, a, a new conventional deal. We did pivot for a short period into something that was a little unique. I, I know this is a long way of getting to your original. No, I want to hear about it. Give me the okay. unique stuff. Let's go. So we did pivot for a little bit, uh, trying to stay in the world that we knew, but refusing to overpay for anything. We uh, we ended up focusing on a niche uh, called, we, we call them, I'm not sure if it's an actual acronym or not, called fractured condos. And what are fractured condos? Uh, it is a, a condominium complex where more than 50% of the owners are, uh, are um, absentee owners, not owner occupants. When a condo community has more than 50% of the owners that are renting their units out versus, uh, versus being an actual owner occupant, it pushes the complex into something we deem might actually be a word called fractured condo. And what is the big thing that that means? Uh, lending gets taken out of the equation. Fannie Mae, which is the biggest lender for uh, these types of condominium complexes, which are typically lower income uh, complexes, uh, Fannie Mae will no longer lend. Uh, most conventional lenders will most, mo no longer lend. And if, when you take some or all of the lending out of the equation, uh, prices plummet. Uh, lending is uh, is what what drives all values. If you, if you couldn't borrow money, uh, we wouldn't be paying close to what we pay for everything. In these niche instances, uh, in these fractured condos where lending is mostly not in the picture, we found that you could have two identical buildings. You could have a 20-unit rental building that's one owner that that one, uh, you know, you buy it conventionally and you could have a 20 unit fractured condo right next door. Uh, same building, same units. The only difference is the one next door is owned by a bunch of individuals and specifically at least 50% of them are owned by people that rent out their units. And the other one is owned by a single person, company, whatever. We found that you can buy the units in the fractured condo, the same exact units for something like a 50 to even up to a 90% discount, the same exact unit if you were to buy them all at once next door. And that concept is something that we, uh, we pursued for the better part of 2016 to right up to uh, that earlier acquisition in, uh, in Granby that I was telling you about. Um, there was a lot of positives and negatives that came from it. Uh, the positives were that the, the concept is real. Uh, it's a real thing. You, you can buy these things uh, at a substantial discount to uh, the market rate that, that conventional rental buildings are going for. The drawback is uh, I learned relatively quickly. It is not a scalable business. It is incredibly time intensive. Uh, you in communities uh, like this, 
you may have some owners that own a couple units, even sometimes depending on the size of the community, you can have owners that own tens of units, but you ultimately to be successful in this, you have to get a hundred percent of the units. And to do that, you have to have a negotiation with every single individual owner in the complex. And you learn that there are a million motivations. There's a million life circumstances. There's so many things that you just can't bank on uh, that could make it, in some instances, impossible to get to that last unit. Some people, no matter how much money you put in front of them, they are just not interested in leaving the home they've been in for 20 or 30 years. They're comfortable, and that's where they want to be. And uh, And whether you're offering them two times what it's worth or three, it, it just doesn't matter. So how do you overcome that challenge then? You're accumulating all these one-off units. It's an illiquid asset. Someone else might also be accumulating alongside of you for a same strategy. So you get to the point where you're almost at the finish line and either you realize someone else has accumulated a lot of units or you have holdouts. How did you get through that? We, when, we, when we identified this idea, we put together a, a, a group, an investment group like we do. We raised a couple million bucks and we, through investigating our market, we're still in Bridgeport, Connecticut. We actually did one in West Haven, uh, Connecticut a few times over. Uh, we identified at that time five communities for a number of reasons that we were going to pursue. Uh, the largest one had 372 units in it. The smallest one had 18 units in it. Well, we identified these partly because uh, they had units that could be bought at that time. We looked at the ownership register and uh, and the most obvious thing is looking at how many LLCs own units tells you right away whether they are a, or 99% of the time will tell you whether they are an owner occupant or not. Uh, and so we identified these five communities and we went out and we started buying. Uh, you buy the easiest ones first, meaning anything that's listed uh, or unfortunately for some people, anything that ends up uh, being foreclosed on. You're constantly scouring every day or every week. You're looking at the, posting of foreclosures and uh, and seeing if any units and buildings that you've identified are coming up for sale. Well, we start buying and buying. And one way you combat one of your things, you're saying, what if someone else is you know trying to do the same thing in your community? Well, once you identify it, uh, you, you realize or you, you know going in, these units are worth more to you than anyone else, theoretically, uh, other than the person that can't be bought with money, their unit is worth more to them than anyway. But I, as far as like an investor trying to compete with you, once you get into one of these communities, the units are worth more to you than anyone else because you're buying them at such a discount to what you know it's going to be worth when it's done. You have the luxury of looking within reason, you have the luxury of looking past what the listing price is. And you can be more aggressive than the next guy, knowing that your whole purpose is not necessarily what you pay for one unit. It's what you ultimately pay on average for every unit in the property. And if you end up on average lower than the one next door that you could have bought, you know, all hundred at once, uh, then you feel good that you had a successful venture. Um, so the one thing you do is you just don't lose to those investors. I, I, I never went to an auction. They, they have these auctions literally on the doorsteps of the unit. I never went to an auction. Literally, I probably went to 10 or 15 of them that I lost. It just, it didn't happen. People saw what these things trade for. And so in their mind, they're, they're looking to buy it around what the, the trade. So I'm, I'm playing a whole different game. I, I know that once again, I get that last unit. If, if this thing should have sold for 40 and I paid 50, well, when it's done, 
they're going to be worth a hundred. So there's, there's so much wiggle room there. So, um, not, not losing to your competitors, uh, is, is rule number one, uh, going after the biggest fish first. Uh, and what do I mean by that? I targeted the largest owners in, in the buildings. Um, there's one in particular that jumps out that we were successful beginning to end. It's a 90 unit community that had, uh, had a person that owned 17 units, had another person that owned eight units. I think the biggest after that was like four. Well, we went in and we, we originally bought one unit and, uh, and realized, uh, for a gazillion reasons, this was an incredible opportunity. This particular community was so distressed. You couldn't believe people were living in it. Had perks on the roofs, uh, at, at, at all the front stoops, the roof, the, the, the overhangs were either torn off or half there. I mean, it, it was unbelievable, uh, how downhill this community had gone. Well, uh, we went in, we bought one. We then targeted the biggest owners and immediately reached out to them. And, uh, and as they say in the Godfather, just made them an offer they can't refuse. You know, they're there as investors. Investors want to make money. And if you're going to offer them something that to them seems like it's, uh, it's way over what they're worth, chances are you're going to be successful with someone like that. Um, and so you immediately target those and, uh, and then you start, uh, literally reaching out to all the individual owners and starting conversations, um, and, uh, and gaining trust and, uh, beginning the process of, of trying to buy the remaining units. And you, the reason it's not a sustainable, scalable business is because of how time sensitive and how unknown that process can be, can become. You learn that uh, you are a white knight to some people. Uh, There's some people that literally felt stuck in these uh, units. They had bought uh, in 2007 or before, they had mortgages that were sometimes twice what the units were selling for. They were stuck. Uh, we came in and once again, we have the luxury of the end goal in our mind, uh, and we could pay someone the amount of their mortgage, even though that same unit was selling for maybe half that. Um, and the numbers on this particular community would just blow you away. Our our first unit we bought there was $34,000. We, we bought units for 20,000. Uh, the, the guy that had 17 units who only started buying there a few years before us bought a number of his units for $5,000. When I went and offered him, I'm going off of memory, 35 or 40,000 a unit for his 17 units. I mean, it was for him, it was where do I sign, you know, done. But so you learn that you are you are an opportunity for a lot of people. Uh, you learn that, as I mentioned before, uh, a lot of people don't have a desire to move, even though the roof is caving in. Um, and uh, unfortunately, some stories are sad, you know, whether it's an age thing, whether they've been there for so long, it's just what they know. Um, it uh, There's just so many different backgrounds, so many different stories. And that process takes a lot of time. Um, this particular community, we, um, we bought our first unit in October of 2017. We bought our last unit in December of 22. Um, it was every bit of a five plus year process. My Right about yeah, December and now 20. what's the current status? So that one community we own ninety of the, or eighty nine of the eighty nine units. One of the units, so before we bought it, uh, had owned two, and they combined it into one. So technically now eighty nine units. Uh, 
we own all the units. Uh, when we got that 89th unit, uh, brought in a team to overhaul the exterior of the property. As we were buying them, we were, we were gut renovating the interiors of our units and renting them out. So, so they were cash flowing along the way, using a lot of those monies to buy more units. Uh, one really unique thing we did is we went in with our cash and bought X number of units, got a bank to lend against the units that we had purchased, used those funds to buy more units, had the bank lend against those new units, and did a third one, which allowed us to get to the last unit, renovate the place. And um, and the major overhaul renovation occurred just in just in 2023. Um, and uh, in August, September of 23, uh, we did a takeout loan that took out uh, just shy of 100% of everyone's equity. And I... I was expecting it to be a major cash out based off of how well we did buying the units. Our our average purchase price across the project was about uh, it ended up being about fifty five sixty thousand a unit. Uh, they needed uh, about twenty thousand a unit of rehab, so we're all in to each individual unit for at, at about eighty thousand. Uh, but that is for immaculate brand new finished units the units those same units today in that market are trading in the 140 range um so and, what's uh, holding it back from this big cash out refi was it performance was it the current debt climate current debt climate was the biggest driver um we ended up refining just a tick under seven and one way that we were able to get some of the units uh, along the way, people that were very hesitant to sell uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, we negotiated long-term leases at, at lower rates. Uh, um, you know, give them a pile of cash, artificially uh, give uh, give them an artificially low rent for a number of years uh, to allow them to figure out their next move, whatever it is. Maybe they want to stay long-term, but just give them that that flexibility that runway uh to uh to make that next move um that was important to a lot of people and so a number of the units uh are still at some artificially low rents which will burn off in the coming years so the combo of that and the uh and the debt market uh took what i thought would be 120 130 percent cash out uh, and had it be just about a hundred percent. Um, but the asset itself is immaculate. Uh, our rents are growing, uh, daily and, uh, and when the debt markets come back into focus, we will certainly have an opportunity to sell for what will be a very large profit, um, or refi. Uh, at a lower rate, take out more cash and, and continue the asset, uh, you know, continue operating and uh, getting the cash flow. I love it. What, what have you learned about, you've renovated so many properties in a hotel, for example, when we renovate a hotel, we'll do all the guest rooms at once. We go floor by floor. It's very systematic. With apartments, you don't have that luxury because leases are turning over at different times. What are kind of the tips and the tricks you've learned to handle renovations across an extended time period? Are you like buying for, you know, cabinets and all this stuff in advance and like storing them somewhere? Do you have your own crew in house that can kind of turn this ad hoc or do you work with people outside of your own company? How does that work? The answer to all your questions is yes, 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 and yes. I, I, the, there definitely is a um, quote-unquote system. And one thing that you certainly try to do is mimic the same renovation over and over again. Uh, what does that allow you to do? Uh, uh, to one of your points, uh, in, with certain materials, you can buy them in bulk, uh, especially if you have the luxury of storing on site. Uh, you can buy those materials in bulk, get a get a discount on that front. Um, it allows the uh, the uh, people doing the renovations, which for me is a combination of 
uh, my own employees. And depending on how occupied they are and what projects we have going on, uh, it's either a combination of them and or uh, certain subs that I use constantly uh, that are uh, that are very close to being employees, but uh, but they're not. Um, sticking to the same renovation plan over and over is uh, is, in my opinion, the best way short term gaining those cost advantages. Long term, uh, when you do have to make uh, turns or you do have to make uh, renovations down the road, uh, you have you don't need to find the the tiles for this unit, the cabinets for that unit. You know, it's it's creating a uh, a standard across all the units uh, that I think is just the most cost effective way to do it, the most practical way to do it uh, from a management running the property and the uh, and those that are installing it, you know, certainly get to know it better and better and better as the uh, process goes on. The slightly unique thing about um, apartments that I think would be uh, a bit different from hotels is I, I feel like this is true without knowing it, that when hotel renovations happen, I think they typically kind of happen all at once. And as you uh, alluded to, this can, apartments can happen over time. Well, sometimes it can be over a long period of time. You can have people that are in units for years, decades even. So when you go in for renovations, although you're, you want to keep a standard, you know, the same tile, same cabinets, countertops, uh, you always run into things that are going to be unique, uh, especially the longer that someone's been in a unit uh, most likely the more that unit needs. Uh, uh, if, if you have someone that, that, uh, left a unit shortly after you renovated it, you're probably doing cosmetic stuff. You get your hands on a unit that saw it was in for 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, you might be looking at electrical plumbing, uh, the walls themselves, the beams on the floors, uh, that 90 unit community that, uh, that we were talking about, that one literally had Every, everything that you could imagine, uh, we did there in some or all of the units, um, which was once again, just a ton of work along the way, but a incredible transformation to witness, uh, as it happened. And, uh, and, uh, in the best uh, of scenarios, not only an incredible transformation, but what looks like to be a very profitable transformation. Um, and also, uh, there is a, a part to it that it, it was a needed transformation. Uh, a community like this with the, with the, uh, previous condo ownership and so many absentee owners and, and people that just don't have, uh, the means they would not mm. have been able to, uh, afford the renovations necessary to this building to make it a viable place to live. Um, so there is that, I'm not saying, uh, you know, there's that I, 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 we did some altruistic thing, but, but in reality, there was, there is good that comes out of doing something like this at well, as well. Uh, just the fact that it was profitable doesn't mean it wasn't also a good thing. What have you learned buying all of these properties to basically just, hard stop. No, I'm not buying this thing. Whether it's something that comes up in due diligence, something market related, you know, debt world related, your guys bring you a deal, you spend 10 minutes on your like, Nope, I'm not doing it because of x, y, and z. What are those things? Well, why did I hard stop in what we were doing? I, uh, I started to realize that people were paying for the privilege of the value add they were they're paying for that in the buy when i was buying all this stuff you would buy it at a you know at that time you know an in place seven cap something like that seven and a half cap and if you did all this work you could get it up to an eight nine maybe even ten cap but in these types of markets and and the amount of work that was required to transition this property that's what 
that's what you need. That was the profit that you needed to see. Well, 15, 16, 17 comes along and I started to realize people are buying these things with the goal of getting to where, in my opinion, you had to start. They're buying these things at in-place forecasts because they were majorly distressed and they, you know, needed all of this. And the rents were low, you know, it had all those things that you would want to see, but they're buying them at, at a price that if they accomplished all of that, it would get them to, in my opinion, the level that you would need to be to start that job. Uh, they, they were just overpaying. Is it bad to end up with a, call it a seven cat property? It is not. In most markets, it's not. But to go through all the work and all the uncertainty to have your ultimate goal be what I think the property should be worth, that's not something that uh, that I would invest uh, time, let alone my or or someone else's money into. Um, that was the that was the moment, and it almost was a moment where it was just overnight we went from having opportunities to not. Um, and that was, uh, that's when we pivoted to that fractured condo, uh, idea. And when that, when I, when I learned that that was, it, it, it is a viable business and it turned out to be successful in a number of these things. When we learned it wasn't realistically scalable, uh, that's when we were, I mentioned again, forced, but not forced, just, uh, refusing to buy into what everyone else is doing just be just because things are trading for these prices doesn't mean it should be um and uh and that's what transitioned us to ultimately uh moving into the class a space uh the, the immediate calculus was that you could buy class a at a cap rate that you when, when when you buy Class A at a cap rate, uh, the cap rate, for lack of a better word, is real. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's it's much more it's much more consistent. It's much more predictable uh, than buying a distressed asset, a, a, you know, value add, or frankly, buying low income assets. There's it's also there's real lot. because you don't necessarily have to dump a tremendous amount of capex in there, which is unlimited. It, it, the combo of that, of the unknown from that, and you and a um, typically a higher demographic renter um, gives you a more consistent, a more uh, confident idea of what your cap rate actually is. Well, we realized that you can buy these Class A ass, assets at actual cap rates that were very close to what you could buy the distressed ones at. After you did all the work, <laughs> there was an arbitrage there. Uh, and so that's why we ended up buying that first uh, uh, Class A asset. Um, and that ultimately was the driver behind us transitioning into development and specifically developing these, these build for rent, uh, single family rental communities, which in my opinion was just taking this Class A arbitrage, which I believe there was, and putting it on steroids. And what I mean by that is, well, if you already had an, a Class A arbitrage, then building something that had a very low supply in these markets uh, created an additional, in my opinion, arbitrage uh, compared to our bread and butter, which was the distressed, you know, low to moderate income type properties. The other thing about that is buyers of class A product tend to have lower return expectations because they're more core assets, which now if you're developing build for rent class A, certainly your costs are higher than something else, but you're also dealing with an investor base that's highly sophisticated and potentially okay with slightly lower returns. <laughs> Definitely the case. The dollars tend to be larger as well, which which plays a role with lower return expectations. You know, in, in the less expensive th properties, you're looking for, you know, doubling your money, triple whatever it is. 
when the zeros get higher, uh, people are looking for solid returns. But in, on the construction cost front, um, so whether it's traditional multifamily or the build for rent, uh, all of these are class A. They, they attract a higher demographic renter typically. And, uh, and the rents are, um, you know, they're, they're usually substantial compared to other properties in a market. The, the driver for us on the build for rent, uh, is directly related to that construction cost, which directly relates to, uh, to rents and, uh, and space. And what do I mean by that? When you build, build for rent. Um, every unit has a front door, back door, uh, every unit has a garage, uh, you are building about 95% of what you build is actual leasable space compared to building a conventional rental building where you have hallways, where you have, uh, elevators, you have trash chutes, you have it, so many things that don't actually, uh, they're cost of the build that don't actually uh, get factored into rentable space. Well, by building build for rent specifically in the markets that we are, where there is a very low supply, or in some cases, no supply of this, and you're competing against other more traditional class A assets, we have the ability to build for a lower per square foot. It might even be a higher build cost because our units are larger. But we're building typically to a lower per square foot, which allows us to compete on the chunk rents, the total rents for our units with the traditional multi, but offer the renter a substantially larger space, uh, typically more green space. Uh, all the units that we've been building have, out, you know, whether it's patios or decks, they have yards. Uh, it it affords us the ability to offer more space at a uh, at a closer to, in some rare cases, lower price than that same renter is going to pay in a conventional multifamily building just because the costs are so much higher. There's so much loss factor in building those conventional multifamilies. So do you uh, look at the opportunity and build for rent as a person's making a trade-off between renting in an apartment building versus renting a home. And it's not actually someone's making the trade of, do I buy a home versus rent a home? It seems like what you're saying is it's more about, they think they can get more bang for, they're going to rent no matter what. They think they can get more bang for the buck in a home than an apartment. I think it's, uh, I think it's definitely both. Uh, because you look at our renter profile and I can't speak for every market, Real estate is a local man's game. Uh, in in the markets that we're in, we are seeing uh, something like fifty percent of our renters are empty nesters. Uh, those empty nesters are making a few calculuses. One, uh, do they need all the space that they have in the home that they've been in for so long? Uh, two, do they want to deal with the headaches and the maintenance and the costs and everything that goes into owning your own home. That renter, um, that client, a potential client, I should say, potential resident is making a choice between do we sell our home and buy a smaller home? Do we sell our home and rent a maybe still smaller home, but rent a home that we don't have to deal with all of the headaches, the snow removal, the maintenance, that that renter, which makes up probably 50% of our renters, uh, is making that calculus. And they're, they've come from so much space. I don't think most of them are really factoring in going from the 3,000 plus square foot home to the 1,000 plus square foot traditional flat. It happens, but I think that's much more exception, not the rule. The other renter, call it 50% or, or now I should say probably 30% is someone that is going to rent no matter what. Uh, and they are, and it might be 
It might be because they buy into uh, what I truly believe, which is renting in most cases is a more is more economically beneficial than owning. Um, it might be that they don't want to deal with the maintenance of owning. Uh, it might be that they don't know if they're going to be in an area for a long period of time, whether it's job related, family, who knows? Well, that person uh, is going to rent no matter what. And that person is certainly going to make the calculus. Do I want to live in a traditional building, uh, which has its pluses to a, to a build for rent? I live in a traditional building and there's, uh, you know, you get to know your renters very well. I think would happen in, in, uh, in build for rent or it does happen, but, um, uh, it's frankly less space. If you don't need all the space, there's benefits to traditional renting, but they're making the choice, uh, essentially they know they're going to rent. Am I going to rent an apartment at this price or do I want more space, maybe a little more rural? Uh, and rent a, a, one of our built rent units at a comparable price. Those guys are renting no matter what. And I think we sell them on the space. We sell them on the community aspect, the greenery, you know, things that you just won't get in a, a traditional multi. How are you capitalizing these build for rent deals on the equity and the debt side? And then what is your ultimate strategy? We've pretty much followed the same playbook. We're now, uh, we broke ground on our third community uh, about a month and a half, two months ago. Uh, and it's also our biggest one. So very excited about that. Uh, but we followed a, a very similar playbook uh, along the way. And that is uh, finding an anchor investor that represents something between 50 and 70% of the equity. Um, as these projects get larger, that's almost necessary to make a project happen. Those uh, that anchor investor for these uh, projects, uh, uh, for two of them, was a fund out of California, uh, and our third one was actually just a very high net worth individual uh, that uh, came in through one of our partners. Uh, but no matter who or what it is, uh, you need that anchor to make the project get off the ground. Uh, and the remaining 50 to 20% call it, uh, is a combination of our capital and what we had traditionally uh, funded our business with, which is the friends and family route. Uh, you know, the, the high net worth, the, uh, the people that you meet uh, in all walks of life, uh, out to dinners and what, whatever it is, at your country club, if you have one of those, um, that's how we had historically uh, funded all of our projects. And we still very much fill a gap of any project with those types of investor investors, uh, partly because a lot of them have been with us for a long time and they deserve uh, the option should they want it. And partly because you want to. Um, the, in my opinion, you don't ever want to be beholden to one bank, one fund, one whatever. You, you, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, you know, banks go out of business. Banks decide they don't want to lend uh, to this anymore. Uh, you know, funds uh, call you one day and say, we love you. But, uh, you know, we, we've just done 10 multifamily deals. And regardless of how much we like you, we can't put any more money out into these types. So we need to diversify. Whatever the reasons are, you should never be, be, be beholden uh, to one source. Uh, and so on the equity side, you got your anchor, you got your high net worth, and you have our capital. On the debt side, um, at least for these first three uh, build for rents, uh, I have used uh, conventional bank financing, um, always used fixed rate debt, even if it's at the expense of a few percentage points, no matter how enticing variable rate debt might look, um, I like to eliminate as many, or in the pun or whatever it is, as many variables as possible. You want to uh, you want to lock in whatever you can, and maybe the most important thing to lock in is the interest rate on your debt. 
uh, once again, even if it's at the expense of what looks like a, uh, a, a potential loss uh, uh, compared to the same rate today going variable. Um, but using conventional bank, rate, bank debt uh, that uh, is fixed and the terms that we've been able to get are typically debt that auto converts to perm, uh, but is prepayable after the construction period uh, at reasonable terms so that you have the luxury of rates gap out. You have the luxury of keeping that debt in place uh, for some time so that you're, you don't have a gun to your head, uh, uh, no, not knowing what market you're going to come out into, uh, not knowing the velocity of your renting in the project. Uh, so once again, even if it's at the expense of what looks like some loss on uh, some uh, some returns, uh, having a period after the 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 uh, construction period is done, where you don't have you don't automatically have to refi that debt is incredibly important, and that's what we've done on these three projects, and something I'll always do. Spoken like someone that has survived multiple debt cycles. I love it. I'm going to, I want to end with what you've changed in your build for rent deals from the first one to the third one, as you've learned more about the strategy and what it takes to execute on these deals. Well, it's kind of funny that we look at our first one, which we broke ground in 21. And we actually just, just finished it in uh in early or mid 23 early 23 we finished construction mid 23 we um we finished the lease up and un very fortunately but almost unfortunately we had everything go right and when i say everything we had everything go right it, it, it was to the extent that it shouldn't be that easy. And I, I bring this up this way because when I talk about our second project, um, we, we learned that ah, it actually isn't that easy. On our first one, even building through COVID, even with all the supply chain issues that we had, um, we found a way to come in on that project under budget uh, quite substantially uh, ahead of time. We uh, we beat the timeline by a couple months, and our rents ended up being on average fifteen percent higher than we had performed in our uh, uh, when we were underwriting the deal. And setting the bar pretty high is is correct. Uh, and along the way, uh, barring the very minor minor hiccups, it went so incredibly smoothly. We uh, we were convinced that we are the best developers on the planet, and uh, nothing could ever go wrong. Fast forward to phase, to our second project. Not that we've had anything that uh, is um, you know deadly to the project, but uh, we've learned that it is not that easy. Uh, this particular project uh, had a significant amount of site work that needed to be done. Our first one had a decent amount. Uh, but this one, just the topography of the site made it, uh, not as easy to, uh, to understand everything that was going on under the, under the ground. Uh, as we got into the site, uh, we learned, uh, we, we've come into issues with soils, uh, issues with some rock, not a lot of rock, but some rock, uh, major issues, uh, with, putting in the utilities, partly, uh, and I'm not going to name the, uh, the town or the uh, agency, but partly to do with this agency that has been incredibly difficult to work with uh, regarding the sewer install. And, uh, and that, I've learned, is something that actually does need to be taken into consideration. Uh, having having certain agencies or, or people that have controls over uh, what you're doing, that things that are out of your control, if there is um, 
a well-known issue, which it turns out there is a known issue here with certain uh, communities that are less development friendly or, what, or whatever, that can have a tangible effect on the timing of the project, which ultimately is a tangible effect on your returns. Well, we have had major setbacks on, from a timing standpoint uh, because of that. And, uh, and when you have, when you have issues on something so early on, like utility infrastructure, those timing issues, they, they, the accordion effect or whatever it is, uh, you experience the effects of that 10, 15, 20 months down the road on, on parts of the build that had absolutely nothing to do with the actual issue that you were dealing with at that time. So really learning to navigate all of the things that all the aspects that go into a development and not just, well, A, not thinking that because it went so well the first time that we are like the best uh, developers in the world because we're not. We learned that that is very much the exception, not the rule. I've fallen victim to that too, by the way. Don't worry. You're not yeah, the only one. Well, it's easy when, uh, when everything just looks so good. Um, but, uh, and, uh, and you also learn, uh, frankly, be because of how successful the first one was and then the challenges we're having in the second one, you learn how important it is to have a team in place that uh, that is nimble, that can handle uh, the inevitable issues that come up in any development. And if it wasn't the issues that we were having with utilities, uh, it will be something else or, or soils or this or that. It will be something else. There's so many moving parts in these developments. Uh, it really brings me back to the the concept of if you have the ability to make anything be fixed, do it. And when it's an interest rate, you want fixed rate debt. But anything that you can lock in, uh, buying out materials, if you have a logical place to store them or whatever it is, buying out materials that are at or near your budget, even if you think for whatever reason, well, in six months, these might cost less. If you can lock in things at numbers that you are comfortable with, do not get greedy and take the wins. And the wins are take the things at the, at the numbers that you know and want them to be, because you will inevitably run into stuff that will cost more, take more time, uh, whatever it is. Um, but I also would, I'm very happy to say with, with all the challenges that we're having on, on, uh, this one that I was describing, we are, uh, today is June 13. We are a month and two days away from our first move-ins there. Uh, so it's an exciting moment. We're bringing 12 units online, the 90 unit community. And, uh, and so I think that we've. I think that we've uh, gotten through a lot of the unknowns at this point. I feel very confident that uh, it should be more smooth sailing moving forward. And, and because of a lot of the things that we put in place of, of the knowns, a lot of the things that we locked in, we are still tracking on that project, even with spending a lot more on things that we weren't expecting, we are still tracking to be under budget on the, uh, on the project. So very, uh, very happy about that. I asked all the guests on the podcast, the same closing question. And that's what's your favorite hotel, favorite hotel, favorite hotel. I'm probably going to have some recency bias on this. Um, but, uh, I had a incredible experience. Uh, my girlfriend and I went to, uh, the South of France last year and stayed at this place called uh la rouge rouge la rouge rouge um i'll have to get you the actual spelling but it's it's this hotel that was right on the water the pool actually uh the edge of the pool is on the water but there's a second natural pool that has the salt water that comes in that and then the food was fantastic and there and it's actually connected to a Michelin star restaurant, which does nothing for my girlfriend when they bring you the, the seven courses that are, you know, this big, but it, 
it was a, a just a great experience really cool decorated really well great rooms great food and and the location couldn't be beat send us the uh send us the name we're going to put it in the show notes it was awesome talking glad we could do it thanks for coming on the podcast thanks so much this was great nice talking with you hey everyone it's jake here thanks again for joining me on this conversation be sure to subscribe on apple podcast spotify or youtube Lastly, don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Jay Warzak. I'll see you in the next episode. Jake Warzak is the founder and CEO of Dove Hill Capital Management. All opinions expressed by Jake and his guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Dove Hill Capital Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and does not reflect or represent real estate, financial, or investment advice. Mm-hmm.